man, I didn't know if I was going to get the masked version of you or not. I know. I know. I almost gave you the uh, the extreme, extremely handsome version of me. But Ooh, you know, I don't know how to handle that. I don't two handsome guys on this. I, I think we had to keep the chicas away. You already know. You married? Well, how do you decide? How do you decide when you're gonna be the masked version, the luchador, or or just you? I think anything honestly, man, anything wrestling related has the mass persona, but yeah. if it's not in the ring, it's really me. Like this is me talking to you. You, you yeah. see me at Ziggy's show. Yeah. That's me. That's me. Everything else on like what you've seen on TV, that was like that had to be me you know but now yeah. it's me so i i don't really get to decide like it really just happens like uh, for example i had apologized to this referee this weekend because you know i had my match the standard match and wow. i was like as soon as i get through that curtain brother i don't know what's gonna happen i don't know what i'm gonna say i apologize but it ain't gonna be me so and of course i had to apologize about three or four times in that match because it wasn't me but it for was what me. what did you have to apologize for well no it wasn't you know it wasn't it wasn't like i had to apologize but for so long people chris yo for, people have like this idea of what lince is or this luchador is so that way when i give them something completely different they're like like what is that but it's yeah. interesting you know it's interesting so i actually started introducing myself as the most entertaining and interesting luchador in professional wrestling so I like that you know, you know how it yeah, is. So we worked together at Zicky Dice's Trouble in Paradise 2 oh, WrestleCon. Yeah. It was WrestleMania weekend. And like your character, if people haven't seen you on the indies, is so different from who yeah. you were in WWE. Well, I mean, it's it's me. It's not different. It's, it really is me. And we just said it a couple minutes ago. I had to represent or present a idea of what a luchador was supposed to be. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of years in, I decided to take that and, and really just turn it up, like turn it upside down. Everything a luchador was, I didn't want to do. I didn't want to speak Spanish. I wanted to speak English. I didn't want to, you know, wear uh, tights. I wore capris. Like, I just wanted to be different. And um, I don't, I, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't apologize for being different, man. Like it really is a, a breath of fresh air just to be me. Be yeah, free. Like, and, and be free. Have, like, no restrictions. Yeah. Man, yeah, a fan did that to me. He was like, you're free. And I did the exact same thing. I was like, oh, you're right. I'm free. Like, yeah, yeah. it's just, it, it, it's a great feeling, bro. It really a is a 420 great references in your match. I mean, again, that is me, man. I'm not going to lie. I don't drink alcohol. I stopped drinking alcohol about uh, four years ago. I don't take Tylenol. I don't take aspirin. I literally just smoke marijuana. I'm a big advocate of it. Um, but it really has helped me psyche. It has helped me anxiety it makes me creative i'm not one of those guys who just like to get stoned i like to do a lot of things i'm not gonna lie to you even before this i was making a pair of trousers like dress pants uh, completely you know rvd out of my mind but they're looking <laughs> awesome bro like everything i do is you know i'm very functional when i do that stuff so uh i'm not condoning it but i'm just saying like for me it works right and so, that's the thing if it works for you who cares like it's it, like it doesn't matter yeah, absolutely. You yeah, know, so I had like, to do. There, I had there, to do, you know, a little uh, the the four twenty reference with the cat cat nip. You know, how to the, give it the to cat the nip. Then after the match, there was a little bit of you know, yeah, making the celebratory, the, yeah, celebratory. Yeah. So, what do you feel like you're able to do now that you're free that you weren't able to do in WWE? Honestly, Chris, man, I don't have to run ideas by anybody other than myself, yeah. and now i could just like really produce all the content i want I, I could sound how i want i could look how i want i could present myself how i want to do it because like how i just said before we have this idea of what lucha libre is and what a luchador is and i just don't want to be that person i always told vince i said you got something special here between me and metallic or dorada where like we understand the wrestling is not it doesn't come first here in WWE because, you know, WWE isn't a wrestling company. It's, a, yeah. it's an entertainment movie company. And we understood that. And we, we wanted to do, you know, everything different than Lucha Libre uh, and, and what they thought luchadors were, but psh, couldn't do it, dude. Couldn't do it. But now, now I'm like on a weekly, you know, I'm doing the wrestling thing on the weekends and on the weekdays, I'm, I'm either creating content, um, you know, wrestling based, but, 
using my wrestling brand to build something else. And to me, it's just content that's entertaining uh, that'll pop me and the boys and, uh, you know, mostly my kids. So that's it. So you have four kids, right? Hell yeah. I'm, I'm wow. mega Puerto Rican. Two boys, two girls. Four. My, my, I don't know how you do it. I'll, I'll tell you how I did it, but I don't think we should talk about it. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, but it's in the bees talk. Yeah, you know, but I, hey, and I was one of those cats that was like, I'll never I was wrestling since I was 16. And I was one of those cats. I was like, I'll never have kids, you know, because again, growing up, I knew what it was like to be a kid in a house that wasn't like really full of love. And I didn't think I could muster that or, you know, because I didn't experience that. So I was like, how can I translate that to my kids? Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I always said I didn't want kids. And then the last day of graduation of college. Uh, yep. Boom. Hey, you're going to be a father. And I was like, oh, well, time to stand up and, and man up. So, yeah, yes, ever since then, I mean, you were a pretty young dad and like the, yeah. you were on the path of, you know, being a pro wrestler. How did how did having kids or your first kid? How did that change? Dude, that was rough, man. Because like I said, I started when I was 16, four years in, I was 20. I had my first kid uh, graduating college. I was already still wrestling, still traveling. And my first daughter was actually probably the hardest because I wasn't with the baby's mom. Uh, I wasn't with her mom. And, uh, you know, I just got in another relationship uh, who she had a child with at three years old. So that's why I have four. I really have three biological, but I've raised the other one since she was three. And, um, you know, she called me dad before any of my kids, but particularly my first daughter, I was actually going to Japan around the same time that she was supposed to be born. And it was a very rocky, you know, start to me and her mom. And, you know, to add on, hey, I may be going to Japan. It was like another thing. Luckily for me, though, I was able to, you know, be there for the pregnancy, there for the birth of my child, my first child. It was beautiful. I cried. I cried you know, cause I had to leave also I had two days with her until I had to leave to go to Japan and keep that commitment. And, um, you know, it, it was very hard because ever since that trip, we have not been able to like rekindle that kind of like daughter father relationship until recently. Um, you know, actually this week, she's actually going to be coming, uh, to stay at my house for a couple of days, the first time. And I mean, forever, you know, ever. So yeah. it, it, it's, it's still an uphill battle. Even now, like you think like being successful or, or somewhat successful in WWE, you think it would be easy or easier, but it really isn't. I feel like I'm in the same spot I was in before, just in more of a demand and more of a hustle than, you know, I was 10 years ago or 12 years ago when she was born. Yeah. I feel like there's pros and cons to being a thousand successful in WWE with a mask on like the pros are like the character is over. Then you can live a, like a normal life, you know, behind the scenes because oh. people not, don't necessarily recognize you, but it's the con that like you were the one that got that character over and then you don't get to like, you know, uh, get that uh, adulation in the rest of your life. I, I saw, I thought about that too, Chris, man. Like I I've not, I'm not going to lie to you before I've wrestled on main event or wrestled on raw and literally took my mask off and walked around the arena with people in the arena while the show was happening. And nobody knew who the hell I was. And you would think like, I was like, Oh man, like I kind of wish, you know, somebody would recognize me or even at the airport, I wish somebody would recognize me while I'm with my friends. But all honesty, I I'm like, I, I get emotionally drained when I'm interacting with people. And to me, I love the, the Bruce Wayne Batman dynamic that I've created for myself where I can be, you know, inconspicuous in the back and, and do my thing in the, in the front. And like, nobody knows what I'm doing, or, you know, and keep me, keep everybody on their toes, but I really don't crave the attention. I crave it in the moments that I'm in the match, you know, mm. because I'm creating something hopefully organic or unique but outside of that, I, I really don't want to be bothered. We talked about where I live. I said, I live away from far away from everybody in the boonies. I don't mind driving 30, 40 minutes to, you know, civilization because I do like that disconnect and peace from my pro wrestling world bubble to my, hopefully back to whatever this reality is, uh, reality that I need to get back to, you know? Yeah. I see the suit jacket on the chair behind you. When, when were you most recently rocking that? I think on a stream, I think uh, on the stream, I either wear my robes or the jacket. And um, this one uh, I was talking about on my stream because I'm making, like I said, 
trousers. I'm also making a suit jacket and a vest. And we were talking about what we liked and what we didn't like. Um, Cause my, my stream helps me create my own gear and they help me make my outfits and all that. So um, yeah, we were just talking about what we liked and what we didn't like um, vocab that I never understood until literally recently. And uh, yeah, it's just, that's why that bad boy is there. I'll put it on if you want. I look sexy in it. <laughs> I, I would don't doubt it. Of course. Come on. So you, like, have you always been putting your own clothes together? Here, yes. Clothes, maybe in the last two years, I started making my own track suits, some, some shorts. Uh, I made some clothes for my kids just because not, not trying to be cheap or, or I, I just like things that look different. My kids do too. And I like practicing on my kids, not just moves, but, you know, outfits and stuff. So a lot of my kids, they like cosplay. So a lot of times I'll be making stuff for them. But yeah, recently I just got into more tailoring. Like, I don't know, something about the bespoke and, and tailoring process really intrigued me. And it wasn't that hard of a transition from making gear to, you know, regular clothes. So Do you make your own masks too? Yep. Yep. Wow. I make everything, okay. everything so, I mean, but the boots. I know that a lot of thought goes into that. How did you yep. land on this design? So originally, okay, my original Lince mask, I've been Lince Dorado forever. So my original Lince mask had actually had the eyes closed uh, with the screen. Um, it didn't have this piece here. It didn't have this piece here. And it didn't have the hair. Everything else was kind of the same. It always had ears. It always had eyes. And it always had a nose. And as I got uh, into wrestling, right before WWE, I kind of like had this like mature moment where I was like, well, you know what? This mask has always been the same. Let's, you know, let's age a little bit. So what I ended up doing for my Cruiserweight Classic mask is I actually grew out teeth over here. I actually moved, uh, I didn't have hair here, but I had a mohawk, uh, which was later replaced with this piece. And in that sense, it was more like, uh, you know, I'm, I was trying to find myself, but I felt like a, like a second part of my, my life or my wrestling life. And to me, that was like my teenage year. So I felt like I was like a teenager, a rebel, a badass. And that's what I wanted to represent when I made that mask. Uh, it's actually right here uh, next to me and one of my mannequins. And then as we got into WWE, you know, of course, I'm, I'm a businessman. So I know, okay, well, the eyes we connect with the audience through eyes. So let's get rid of the eye visors. Uh, the teeth were making it a little bit hard for you to understand me talking when they did let me talk. So I got rid of them. And then, uh, you know, like all hair, I said, well, hair always, you know, I'm bald underneath. So I was like, well, hair will move from the top and move to the side. So let's move, let's get some, uh, some, um, you know, sideburns mixed in with the beard. So it all kind of flows in and a little bit more mature look. If you see a lot of gentlemen now, like having that husky like musky look so i was like you know we'll do it naturally with the mask yeah and uh and as we kept going on we just kind of kept evolving until you know finally we got to this part with um you know again this is replacing the hair my eyes are open so you can hear me oh, my mouth is open so you can hear me and i still like the idea of the hair on the side going into the beard um just so it's all uniformed and when i do like brush it out it does look cool yeah. and fluffy so I feel like every luchador just instantly gets compared to Rey Mysterio, which could could be a good thing or a bad thing. I feel like. What do you think it is? I'll tell you what it is after me, after you. Hmm. Well, I I mean I I think he's the greatest luchador of all time. Of certainly the, the the most well known. But I also feel like everybody thinks that you would then need to perform like him, which would be a a real detriment because he has his own style. You have your own style. So you know who actually I like. And I'm not going to say more than Ray, but I've always said this. If it wasn't for this person, there may not be a Ray. Hmm. And I'm not going to say Conan. I'm going to say Psychosis. Oh, sure. Sure. So if you look at my style, it's actually based a lot off of Psychosis and like super crazy Tajiri. Guys who kind of like were, were meshing with Ray and, and elevating Ray, you know, at that time. But man, without those guys too like psh, fire yeah a lot of guys want to compare a lot of luchadors to ray and to me honestly i think that's a bad thing i think that's a bad thing because when you think of luchadors you think of like maybe ray you think of mil mascaras santo blue demon and then everybody else after that right everybody else follows that 
and every one of those underneath got the comparison like oh the ray ray mysterios and i'm like nah dude there's we all are very different and unique different styles different uh, mass the other culture may be the same but we're all very very much different you know especially me i'm very different (laughs) very different very different. Is that, is that something that when you go into WWE, they just go, oh, you're a luchador. We'll just put you in this box over here with the other luchadors. I think at first that might have been the case. And I, I, I knew that coming in. So I, I tried really hard to break that. So, uh, you know, try to be brother, brother with all the all the producers and like, oh, OK, this guy does speak English. You know, this guy is, you know, not just a luchador. I try to be like not buddy, buddy, but I try to get, you know, be good brothers with everybody. So that way they can you know, think of me as other than Ray, you know, or other than like just a a generic luchador. And it did really, it really did help us for a little bit, you know, being able to uh, communicate with the bosses and not just like hide in catering or hide in the locker room. Like, you know, anytime we had a problem or wanted to speak, you know, they were there to listen to us. So uh, it did help that we were able, me personally was able to speak, you know, really good English. So that way I could communicate and kind of get away from that, that, idea of like oh he's just another mask guy or just ray but at the end of the day you know wwe is kind of like disneyland they kind of need one of everything on each show so if you fit the bill you fit the bill and then it's kind of hard to convince the beast like you you different man you really it really is like i remember conversations heart to heart conversations me metallic and, and vince uh it, it was it was very intense like emotional and homie was biting vince was biting on everything and it just like as soon as we left that door it was kind of like all right what's the next problem what's the next issue for him you know so like doing things on show days wasn't beneficial for us you know Mm -hmm. and if we had if we had any appointments to go to you know stanford or outside of outside of tv i think we could have been something bomb something fire in wwe but it's just hard to communicate during show times that's the only time we were able to communicate really basically it's just so crazy to think that you recently told this story where you went to wwe and people didn't know you knew you speak uh, spoke english yeah first day <laughs> in memphis I, i'll never forget that and it, i don't hate I, I don't have no like ill will toward anybody it really is because of ignorance i totally get that it it really is totally ignorant uh that they just didn't know but at the end of the day man it's it's really the culture everywhere like you look at some dude who looks brown and you assume like is he spanish like am i i get people who get very scared to communicate with me or like don't want to do podcasts with me because they think I only speak English. And when I send them the email or a text or they interact with me, they're like, holy crap, like, what, what the heck? Like, I was not expecting that. And I'm like, well, because you're being ignorant. That's why, like, just talk to me. I'm a cool, I think I'm a cool ass dude. Like, I just like to have fun and and, and do, do some wrestling stuff, with, you know? But it, it was mind boggling at first when that dude said that to me. I won't say who it is, but, uh, you know, after that, I never had an issue me personally uh with somebody you know ever questioning if i was you know uh mexican or un-american or whatever you know they understood that like i I made it very apparent like no i'm this and that's how it's going to be yeah at what age did you move from puerto rico to i guess we'll call it like the mainland sure so check it actually you know what i was the only generation the first generation not to be born in puerto rico so my mom and my dad oh, were born in Puerto someone Rico. Someone needs to update your Wikipedia then. Yes. What city were you actually born in? Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> I assumed you were born in Puerto Rico and then like six, eight months old, whatever. Then nah, so, over. so my mom and my dad, they were born in Puerto Rico. And literally like my sister was born here in the States. And I think there was talks for them to move back. And then I was born and then like, we, we all just stayed here. My grandma ended up moving. My grandpa ended up moving. Uh, I don't have I don't really have a big family left that I stay in touch with like my circle but uh, besides my grandparents on both sides uh, right now my both grandparents or my both grandfathers are both deceased uh, leaving both my grandmoms and my mom and my sisters left so that's pretty much my family right now left besides my kids Um, but yeah I I just born in Camden New Jersey right outside Philadelphia a lot of people always think 
I'm either Mexican or Puerto Rican. I'm 100 percent Puerto Rican. Uh, just living in America. I'm American. I'm American. Like, yeah, <laughs> I would hope you know? that after yeah. this comes out, somebody goes in and updates. They're not going to do it. OK, they're not going to do it. That's why I started also announcing myself this weekend. I said, you know, uh, by uh, what I say, I said the, the Lucha Lounge in San Juan, Puerto Rico, by way of Camden, New Jersey, because, again, I want to give I want to represent my people. Mm -hmm. Right. Even if they even if half of them think like, oh, this guy's the greatest because he's representing us. And the other guy's like, oh, well, he ain't from the island. He ain't representing us. It don't matter. I'm representing my people. And then I'm also representing where I grew up in the in that part of the hood, because without that, that I wouldn't have that, you know, in me as well. So I'm representing both my people for, in Puerto Rico, the island and, you know, the hood I grew up in Camden, New Jersey. So shout out to all y'all out there. Were your first listening. words Spanish or English? Ever since I can remember, I want to say English only because, like, again, my grandparents always spoke Spanish. I could speak to them in English. They speak to me in Spanish. We, we communicate that way. Or huh. some, it, naturally, I'll speak Spanish with like the homies if they just like don't feel comfortable speaking English. I'm like, I got you, dog. Like, I'm not going to like, you know, force you to do it. Uh, but yeah, I don't really like stress speaking Spanish or English. I know a lot of cats do all my, they're like, why don't you speak Spanish? Why don't you speak English? Again, I'm just trying to connect. And most of my audience is, you know, English speaking. So it's just easier that way. So if y'all listening to this and y'all got beef, kiss my fucking ass. Sorry, beat that out. <laughs> all right. I'm just like tired of just pleasing everybody else. I'm just trying to please myself, dog. Yeah. For real. It's all you can do. All you can do is just make yourself happy. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I'll tell you straight up. There was a time in WWE I got sent home for about four months early on in my career. Um, not for having a bad attitude, but just standing my ground. And now me and this guy, mega cool. Hey, he's in a top position, but that's why my ass got sent home. Uh, he's in a top position now. But uh, yeah, I just didn't like the way that he was like communicating with me. I didn't like the way he was like handling my ideas. I just basically I, I, we were going to have it out and I got sent home. And in that time, dude, I was like, nobody communicated with me. Nobody. I felt like I was in exile. This is when Emma and Darren Young got fired. So I was like, all right, well, maybe I'll get fired too. And, and whatever, let's see what happens. And uh, I was in a bad mental state, really mm -hmm. bad mental state. And because again, I made it to there and then I felt like I was getting sabotaged and then it wasn't what I wanted. And like, I just wanted more. I just really wanted more. And I just felt like I wasn't getting it. And then um, I started reading, started reading a lot of like inspirational books. all these books back here that you read, uh, that you see, like I legit yeah. read them. Like I legit read them. So the top three or the bottom three are all math books. Cause that's what I used to teach um, af after college. But all the ones above there are all wrestling and inspirational books, especially the top two. And I remember um, reading a book called Relentless by Tim Grover. Yeah. And I was like, man, this guy's inspirational. Then it was like, give me another thing. Then I started reading like a stoic life. Like, and I was like, oh my God, what is it? And then just like my peace of mind started to get so good that like anything at work, anything outside of, you know, this was so easy to deal with. Like, I just, I didn't care. I was having fun. Like you said, I was having fun and I was at a really good state of mind. So I always recommend everybody. And even right now, when I do seminars, I say, yo, if y'all want to be a pro wrestler, y'all got to start reading, 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 because I don't care who you are. If you're a pro wrestler, you got some kind of mental illness. You'll go and you will develop that because of social media, all the stuff that comes with being a pro wrestler. It is very stressful and it's very taxing on your mind. And if you don't take care of your mind, just like your heart, right? Your heart's a muscle. Your mind is a muscle too. If you don't take care of that as well, you're going to start to deteriorate and you're going to hate this business. And yeah. I started hating it a little bit before, but then like once I started reading and finding myself and finding that peace, I was like, man, I love life. I love life too much to, to fill, you know, fill it up with hate. So what book do you recommend that people start reading? Man. Okay. I've, I've read all the books that you just listed. So I'm just fascinated. What about 48 laws of power? I don't know that one. Okay. I would, if I'm going to write this it, down right now, Xavier Woods hooked it up for me in the, uh, the locker room one time. I mean, a couple of dudes, he was like, yo, read this book. It'll change your mind on how you look at WWE, how you approach people. It's called the 48 laws of power. 
he was correct. A thousand and ten percent correct. Like it, the book is so incredible to not just pro wrestling, but just to life, how to deal with bosses, how to deal with. It's just so smart. It, it made so much sense. So that's my very first book. I always recommend people to read if mm. you're a pro wrestler. Read that one. I also recommend the one I just said, uh, Relentless. That one by and, Tim. And Grover. people need to know Tim Grover was Michael Jordan's coach. Yep, and Bryant, uh, Kobe Bryant's coach. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. So there it is, so, right there. That's a, that's a pretty good endorsement. Yeah, crazy. And then I just want want to say one more. Um, actually, two more. I'm gonna say please. One one is called uh, Unfuck Yourself. Literally, oh. no, I'm not saying to you, but that's what the name of the book is. Um, I just finished that one a few months ago. Man, it's really good too. That's yeah, a good I, one. I caught myself doing stuff, and I was like, I need to stop doing that. Yep, you're right. And, and I think that one? the the really the thing I love about that book is it it reminds you that everything, all the problems are right up here. They're in your head. You're the, yes, you are the yes. source and all you're the cause of the problem of every problem that's happening. And you're also, you could be the solution of the problem. Yes, that's what I mean. The cause and the solution yeah. of every problem. Yes. And then the last book I actually had my girl read because I read it and I was like, babe, this is, this is me. I need you to read this book. Mm. And it's called the mask of masculinity. Oh, by and Lewis Howes. Yes. And I was I like, wow, podcast. I literally have every one of these masks at once, once a month. Like I'm, I'm using one of these masks once a month. And it, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, he's literally talking about how men or people, I, he talks about men in general, but it's mostly for people too, how they mask different things, you know, through laughter or through anger. And I was like, wow, babe, this is me. And if you ever want to like, you ever see me dealing with something it's probably in this mm. book so like figure it out and uh ever since she's read that too we've been on a collision course of like just in peace like super nice like she knows when i'm like kind of in a funk and she knows exactly what i need you know to lift me up um man, just because of that you know the knowledge of reading some literature blow my mind yeah. which which kind of is like intriguing because growing up i hated reading and literature me too Again, my worst subjects were english and reading and my best ones were math and then all of a sudden in my 30s and 20s i'm like wow i'm finding peace in reading and like that's it's crazy i remember watching a ted talk where someone was explaining like the concept of a book is someone taking 20 years of their knowledge and putting into like two three four hundred pages and i went Oh, I've never had someone explain it to me like that. Yeah. Like, and if you can take all of their knowledge and read it in whatever it is, you know, five hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, however many hours it takes you to read it. Like what a win for you. Yeah. Well, you also got to sit down and read it. You can't just get the book and not well, do anything with that's it. That's why they yeah. call it shelf help for a lot of people. True. True. I, you know, I won't put any books put on, on the shelf. Yeah. I won't put any books on there that I won't read. There are literally two books right here that I'm going to read. And then uh, in the next Ooh, couple what's weeks. what's next? So right now I got actually uh, this called Resili Resilience. Resilience. Mm -hmm. um, I saw something on Instagram where this lady like took a concept that was negative and made it into a positive. And I just like the way that she did it. And I was just like, ooh. And then she said, oh, I got this from um, this book called Resilience. And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to read mm -hmm. that next. So I got that one. And I'm actually reading this NFT book right now. Um, just the idea of, you know, NFTs, but I'm, I'm bringing it into the wrestling world. Um, for example, I had a great talk with Gabe Sapolsky the other day, and um, I'm not really interested in NFTs, but I'm more interested in why people are interested in NFTs, especially in the long run. Yeah. So my mindset is like, how could I take that same idea and apply it to wrestling? How can yeah. I get people interested in me in the long run? Not just now for the quick, you know, like the quick money exchange. I just want it in the long run. So that's where we were kind of like intriguing, like, what are make what's making nfts so desirable you know why is why are people want it what's the long game that's why i'm trying to apply those concepts to uh pro wrestling yeah and, you know something a little bit different have you read the four agreements of course oh yes. that that was a life-changing book for me yes i kept and calling it the four arguments for some reason but yeah agreements is the thing yeah <laughs> And they, well, they are kind of too. are arguments with yourself because you do true. these things true. all the time. But for anybody who hasn't read it, it's four simple agreements. If you can mm -hmm. make these with yourself every single day, you will live a much better life. And it's be impeccable with your word. Always try your best or always do your best. Don't make assumptions and don't take anything personally. And they sound so easy when you say them, but like 
we all every single day take things personally and make assumptions yeah oh no a thousand percent i gotta stop taking things personally i gotta we stop, all do i gotta stop doing that i gotta stop taking things seriously like yeah I, like you said everything's up here everything's up here so we could take something that probably is negative and make it 20 times worse but I, I yeah i need to stop doing that as well what do you think about manifestation you believe in that uh, absolutely yeah, I, I do too and i think that i mean we could go down a deep rabbit hole with this but i think it, the thing that's so fascinating to me is that when you set your mind to something and you point your needle of the compass in that direction it's amazing how many things start flowing your way no well you know what i'll, I'll be very honest with you kindergarten is when i wanted to be a pro wrestler and also that's the time my memory kind of started it started a little bit before that in preschool but like really like i my mindset i've always felt has been the same from now than it was in preschool when i found pro wrestling and i said i wanted to be a pro wrestler hmm. no matter what was introduced in my life or whatever i was exposed to would not have changed my mind i knew i was going to be a pro wrestler so i manifested this my entire life since you know kindergarten and i knew day one like what i wanted to do so and i'm still doing it man you are i and i think that there's a big distinction that needs to be made with manifestation because i think a lot of people think oh i just like put this out into the world and i dreamed it and like it didn't happen well part of the manifestation is figuring out okay what's the next step you know mm -hmm. for you it's finding a wrestling school it's starting to train it's working out it's those things and like that all becomes part of that whole thing yeah, I think people are scared to just do the work. Like they want to manifest great scared to fail. That's what it is. Yes. And pe okay. Oh, now I'm glad that you said that. So that was the idea that the girl in my, in that Instagram video said, she's like, everybody's scared to fail, but you got to look at it as learning. And when she said that, I was like, I've heard that before. And I was like, man, that made sense. But then like, when she said it, I was like, oh, okay. There must've been a reason why I've ran across this, uh, this particular post and, you know, bought the book and all that. And yeah, people are scared to fail, but it's a learning experience. And if you're not learning from, you know, what you're failing at, then yeah. you're going to be stuck in the same like rut. Like every failure is a lesson. You have to remember that every failure. Well, is like if, if we all gave up after the first failure, none of us would walk because the first no. time you tried to walk as a kid and you fell over, you would have gone, well, you know, I'm not good, for I'll me. Crawl. Yeah. Yeah. I'll crawl. Uh, I'll roll yeah. Over. I'll just figure it out. <laughs> Come pick me up, mom. I'm tired. Yeah. Right. But I think I love that idea that it's not win or lose, it's win or learn. Yeah. And that's how I look at my WWE career. Like, again, nobody, I, I never manifest like, oh, I'm going to be WWE champion or whatever. That would have been cool. Great. Yeah. But at that time of me, like growing up, that wasn't a thing. I just wanted to be a pro wrestler in WWE. And then like when I got there, I was like, okay, cool. Let me learn all of these things that I absolutely can. So when I leave here or if I ever leave here, my book and all of those knowledge in one time, you know, in 20 years or whatever it is, I could give it to pass it off to somebody who may use it and now will be a head start from where I was, you know? So like these things are all part of our lives. And a lot of people just have to be able to take risks on themselves because nobody's going to take it on them. Yeah. Nobody. I think, you know, on that same vein, like that, the idea of the reticular activating system is, is so powerful. And that's like the thing where you're looking to buy a red Volkswagen Jetta. And all of a sudden, now you're spotting them all the time. They were always there, but yeah. now you're going, oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. There's another one over there. And that happens in our life in so many different ways. But I'm going to say, I wonder how many people actually catch on though. You yeah, know, that's a good point. So some like, people will catch about, like, on when, and be like, you know, oh, maybe it's a bad idea. <laughs> some people will like, catch, you know what I'm saying? Like maybe, yeah. maybe some guys will see that and be like, oh, maybe too many people have it. But if you want it, you want it. Like, just go get it. <laughs> do yeah, what you got to do to get it. I always say like, if somebody's doing the thing that you want to do, that means it's now possible for you to do it as well. Like, it's not just about like being lucky. It's about like putting in the work and figuring it out. Yeah, I don't think luck is a, th I mean, my girl always says I'm extremely lucky, I, but again, I do believe in karma. I'm, I'm a very, I try to be very positive and all that, but it, when it comes to achievements and stuff like that, there's no luck. There's just work that goes into it. And everybody, again, another post that I love that I always uh, quote is everybody 
says, oh, that guy's lucky, but they don't ever see the work that goes into what that person had to go to, to be, a, you know, uh, successful. Yeah. And nobody, I, I, you know, I, say, I love the quote, uh, you know, I find that the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yes. Yeah. And that's crazy. I, I, that's why, you know, me personally, that's why I don't talk to a lot of my family because they saw me as that. And again, I, I got four kids, man. I got four kids and a girl I got to take care of. Like, I can't be taking care of grown ass people. No offense if y'all are hearing this. I'm sorry, but this that's the honest truth. And that's why my relationship with my family has kind of like dwindled a little bit. But at the end of the day, like I'm working, I'm using my body. I, I'm not, it's not me being lucky and hoping like oh, I get a big paycheck or whatever. No, I get the same check or I used to get the same check every week. Now I'm like, you know, I'm hustling and bustling to get that money to, you know, have my, my family have what they need and yeah. food on the table. Do you think that you'll ever have like regret? that if you don't reconnect with your family, like they're only going to be here for a certain amount of time. Like, do you not feel that in five or 10 or 20 years that it'd be nice to just have them in your life in some sort of way? Now I want to say, yeah, Chris, I'm not going to lie, but I'm just so cold hearted when it comes to that stuff because of all the years of not feeling that love as a child. You know, my father was murdered when I was little. Uh, so, and my mom being awesome when she was younger single parent went to school did her job i think she may have worked two times or two jobs but with that comes lack of love in the house yeah you know so and pain like it sounds like and, there's a lot of pain there yeah so it's kind of like you know it's it's kind of hard to to want to rekindle and i try we all try we do on both sides we do try but it's hard when you're an adult and people look at you still as a child you know, and I'm not a child anymore. And I think that was one of the other things too, not only in WWE, but outside of WWE, it's a hard thing where people known you forever, almost 16 years, 15 years as this young guy that you broke in when he was 16. And now you like about to be 35, but they still see you as this like 20 year old punk kid. I'm just like, dog, I'm not like, you know, uh, I yeah. just don't want to deal with that. So it's kind of hard to break that barrier when you're an adult and a parent too. Uh, now that I know what a parent's like, but again, the, just the idea of how to parent is different. So never say never, right? Obviously well, never say it never. It sounds like you want to give your kids all of the love and all of the attention all, that you didn't yes. get. Yeah. I, I love my, my babies are my babies, man. Like I get choked up talking about them. Like I never, I don't even want animals in my house. I got two pets and I was like, I can't get another one because of that's just a lot of love that I, you know, that you got to give. I cried on my birthday when my, my fish died, a carnival of goldfish that we had for like three years, but I love the shit out of him because I love life. I love, you know, anybody who brings joy to my family, whether it's a person or animal, I love you. So when that fish died, I was like in tears. So I, I need, I give all the love to my kids, whatever. And I'm not saying I spoil them or whatever, but I love walking around my house and my kids just randomly saying like, daddy, I love you. And then just walk away and do their stuff. I'm like, that shit would never have happened in my house. I didn't have anybody to say, I love you too. You know, because mom was either at work or my dad was, you know, dead. My stepdad was also working, but there's a disconnect because he's your stepdad, you know? So it's kind of like, damn, who do you say I love you to? Like, you don't, I didn't get to say that until teenage years when I really meant it, you know? Well, I, when I thought I really meant it. So I, my babies get the love right now. That's why it's hard for me to, you know, give love to anybody else. And it must be tough with the schedule you were on. I mean, you were away so much that you want to make those two days that you're back at home with the kids, like mean as much as you can. Yeah, I mean- the first two or three years were really hard, like right before pandemic, uh, because again, we would go Monday and we would do 205 as well. So sometimes on Friday when they moved it. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't get to go home to my babies until the weekend. And even then it was like, well, let me go sleep for two hours or three hours. And then like when I get up, I'm like half asleep. I don't want to do anything. But then when pandemic hit, it was awesome dude it was like i wasn't traveling i was in florida we were airbnb we were like you know uh do the hotel because we were here in florida i worked one day a week to walk them to school pick them up you know i did things that i wasn't doing ever or even thought that i could ever do like simple things like just picking up your kid 
Like you think everybody has that like advantage and like some wrestlers don't have that advantage, man. Like I didn't have that advantage at all. And now I have that advantage where, you know, after pandemic, I was able to do that. And that was something so gratifying for me that I was like, okay, well, I like this. I don't, I don't want to change this. So yeah, yeah it, it was hard. But uh, again, without that lifestyle and without that big break, man, my, I would have been stuck in a two, two uh, bedroom townhouse still with four kids and my girl in there. So I'm very fortunate. I would, again, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed to have the life that I have right now. Yeah. Do you think about life after wrestling? Dude, I had this bad trip experience probably about a month ago okay. because I, I wanted, of course, everybody talks about life after wrestling. Right. And I don't know. A lot of people don't. A lot of people think this is going to last forever. I think, I think, I th happens. no, a hundred percent. I think honestly, if you're, if you real, if you're realistic, like you have to think about two things. One, you have to think about and accept death. And two, you have to, in this case, accept life after wrestling. And I've accepted both in my, in my life. I've come at peace on both. Well, the first part that, but the, the life after wrestling, I literally just came to peace with it probably within the last month where I do find myself after wrestling, maybe open up a wrestling school. I'm writing actually two books right now. So I'm hoping, you know, maybe that'll open up my eyes to maybe more literature or something. But um, that's why I, I wanted to do something outside of wrestling, like the tailoring or, you know, cartoons or something like just something outside. I think once I'm done with wrestling, I'm done with wrestling. I don't want to, I don't want, temptation i don't want stress i don't want to you know come back when i'm 99 percent. i want to be 110 percent. you know yeah. i don't want anybody to think like oh man that guy lost a step or man that guy used to be really good like i'd never i don't want that in my life but um i don't think of it often but i do think of it and um, going back to what i was saying before that last trip i had this image in my head of this triangle and on one side of the triangle, like a piece of paper cut into three pieces, one side of it was basically like my childhood, everything. I could see my childhood. It was like crazy. And then in the middle, it was like my wrestling career. And then on the last one, it was just blank. And I was like, why? Why is it blank? And it was because I didn't know. Mm. And I was, I was so frustrated with myself creatively and professionally because I was like I needed to find that answer like am I going to be okay mentally after wrestling am I going to be okay after wrestling period and then then I got my answer I was like it doesn't matter just you'll get there and once you get there just like everything else you'll figure it out mm -hmm. so then I stopped caring about it and then I just understood like okay there is life after wrestling don't know what it is I'm looking forward to it but I'm not going to stress myself out about it right now yeah do you feel like you really need to capitalize on the next, let's call it five to 10 years of your wrestling career? Yeah, I, I had, there's a number in my head. There's a number I'll say right here. I said, 40 years old, five years. I want to be okay. done. I don't think um, my style and the way my body is right now inside and outside of the ring. I just, again, I want to be able to leave on my own two feet, very happy with my career. Uh, and, healthy you know and i think could i do it past 40 absolutely you know sure. but i just me knowing i don't want to put out something that's 99 percent, you know and i think i'm ready to like just move on at that point like again did everything in wwe i could wrestled in tna wrestled in impact mexico japan um like, what else could i really do that like really once you know that a guy from Camden, New Jersey, a guy who should never have been born, guy who should never have gotten out of the ghetto. What else could I do to like help me out? Like it would just be boosting my ego at that point. I don't have an ego. I don't need an ego. Like I just, I want to be like, man, my, my dad was cool. My kids say my dad was cool, but now he's my dad. Like I, to me, that's much cooler. You know, I think there's point. a lot of your fans that want to see you in AEW. Yeah, but I'll be honest, man. I see AEW as the same as if, me, for me, me personally, if I would be inserted into AEW, I'd just be in the same spot. Like, I'd just be another mask guy. Like, you already got another mask guy there. You got two. You got Phoenix and, and Pentagon. Like, like you're already good unless you 
I don't know, let me talk for them or let me talk for me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I would love to go to any company who would just be like, what do you want to do? Mm. And I'd be like, all right, this is what I'm thinking because this is the idea I've had for about 20 years. And I think we can make some money off of this. But like nobody wants, nobody, again, is ignorance of like, oh, why, why are we investing in a lucha guy when we got this lucha guy or that lucha guy or this lucha guy? Well, I'm the fucking best, dog. I'm the most entertaining and interesting motherfucker in the planet when it comes to Lucha Libre. Like we having a conversation with Chris right now in English and everybody's intrigued and everybody's like this, like, oh my God, what yeah, is going on? They've, everybody because, got a list of books they need to read now. Right? But like at the end of the day, like I want to just... I want freedom. So even the, the money's great. I don't care about money, man. Like I said, I've been poor before. I've been broke before. I've been in the hood before. I, I'll be good. But I just want that, like, let me tell my story. And if AEW is the place to do it or Impact, sure, I'll go wherever. When's this book going to come out? I can't wait to read it. Well, there's two. All right. There's two. My, um, my, satire to pro wrestling that's not what the name is but that's it's like a survival guide to pro wrestling we'll be okay. actually coming out to in november um hopefully this year i think it's in november i was talking to my publisher about it and then um i'm writing my part one of my like basically my life um i don't know when that's gonna come out just because it's so you know there's a lot of things in my life i don't know what i want out you know well i mean you're the author you get to decide what goes out so I'm going to put everything out. I don't care. I'm going to put everything out. I'm going to apologize right now. And then uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to say, well, y'all bought the book anyway. So thank you. Much. <laughs> What's the best way that you're interacting with fans right now? Is it Twitch? Right now? Yeah. Per like personally, Twitch yeah. uh, on there, my fans and my OGs, man. I What's love your my channel, OGs. by the way, so people can find you. Yep. Lucha Lit Station. Uh, you come out there, we usually make gear, we make outfits, we play games, and we just have a good time on there. I, I'm going to be doing my podcast on there, Blunt Talk, um, the Talking Blunt, sorry. Me and my boy are going to be on there just, again, just doing what I want to do, Talking Blunt with maybe some, I don't know, I can't say it here, but uh, yeah, right there. And then like my Instagram is kind of like taken over by my daughter. I paid her to do it just because, ah, again, social media is just such a drag bro like i'm just over reading comments that i just don't want to read them i really don't like i don't want to have that moment of record ralph where he reads the comments and he realizes the internet's the worst like <laughs> i'm done with it what a movie oh my god i what love a that reference movie. great wow man i told everybody if you're a pro wrestler watch record ralph too because that's exactly the moment where he realizes the comments could be your best friend or they could be your worst enemy and yeah. yeah, you gotta, you gotta deal with it. But honestly, that besides Twitch and Instagram, I'm more myself on Twitter. I've been kind of wild on Twitter. I apologize right now. You'll see some stuff on there that I don't know. Like they definitely not PG 13 or 14, but uh, again, at the end of the day, that's me, man. Like, I'm not going to hide who I am. I'm not going to sugarcoat. You know, I, I don't have that anymore of like, should I tweet this? Like, you know, I'm going to tweet it because I'm, I want to tweet it or I'm going to yeah. say this because I want to say it. So at the end of the day, man, that's the best way to find me and talk to me or try this to troll is, me so I could troll you back. This is like the most mindful and like fascinating conversation I've had on the podcast in so long. Yo, man, I, do you remember what I said to you at a Ziggy Dice show? I don't know. Uh, something like uh this doesn't happen in canada well yeah i did say that one too when i was getting my <laughs> ass beat but i had said uh i had said i said um what you said when when, when you're gonna be on my podcast yeah i was like sure whenever you tell me you probably one of those people who didn't think i could speak english were you oh, no no there's a lot of people and it's not you it's just there's a lot of people that don't want to do podcasts and i get it yeah. and i i never want to be the person who's like bugging someone to do something they don't want to do so no. I just figured I'd float it out to you and you were like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, hell yeah. And then yeah. I texted Well, you. I was, I was definitely one of those people who didn't want to, but if, when we met in person, I was like, oh, he's actually a cool dude. Like, I know me personally, like you see me in, in public, like, you know, sometimes I could be like cool. And sometimes I could be like, oh, he don't like that person at all. But like me and you hit it off. And I was like, yeah, anytime you want, brother, I got you 110%. So I you, Renee, you. and Jericho. And I've got a whole like, bunch of books that I got to read. This is uh, 48 Laws of Power, number one on my next uh, list. It's thick. It's a thick book. Okay. You might want an audio book that one. House. It's my favorite, if not one of my favorite podcasts, The School of Greatness. So The Mask of Masculinity. Yeah. I haven't read, so I'd like to read that. 
Oh man, you're gonna love that. Trust me, you are gonna love that. And I'm, I'm telling you, once you read it, you're gonna be like, wow, this is pro wrestling. I know a bunch of pro wrestlers. Right afterwards, you won't. Text me. <laughs> I end every conversation talking about gratitude, which I think you will appreciate. Yeah. I wake up uh, every day. I say out loud three things that I'm grateful for, and I do it before going to bed. So, what are three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? Very first off, my family. Without them, I would not be here. I'm also grateful for my brain because without that, I would not be the creative genius that I am. And I also am thankful for air because without that, I would not be able to fill my lungs and have this great moment with you and all my friends. So I appreciate that as well. Appreciate you. Those are three great things to be grateful for too. Much Thank you so much. Dog. What a great conversation, my friend. Hell yeah, bro. It was a lot better than I thought. I thought you were going to roast me or something. I just messed with you. <laughs> nah. This this conversation would happen in Canada, though. It would. It would I would yeah. just, uh, you know, it, I'd have to say sorry. 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 What part of Canada were you from? Just outside of Toronto. Pickering, Ontario. Okay. I like Toronto. It's actually, and- it's actually uh, right next to where Renee grew up. She grew up in the city over Ajax. I like Toronto everywhere else in Canada was not nice to me. So I will say Viva Toronto. <laughs> oh man. Vancouver. I'm looking at you. I love Vancouver. Come on. I like Vancouver until TSA want to go through my bag and try to make me take my phone out of my case. And I'm like, well, that's some silly shit. I'm not doing that. Mm. And yeah, it was a big scene. I see. That's the story for another time. Yes, yeah, sir.